Thank you, Fomio, and uh, thank you, Madame Mori, for the invitation to also take part in the celebration, this 10th anniversary of this museum, Mori Art Museum, that has made so much, done so much, actually, to the art scene, not only in, in uh, Tokyo or in Japan, but actually in Asia and the world as well. And it's an honor to be here. I was here for the opening 10 years ago, and I'm delighted to be back, and have, of course, been back many times since. Um, I will try to talk about something here now in 25 minutes, which I usually take an hour and a half to talk about. So we'll see where that takes us. Um, I'll talk about the museum project that uh, uh, Fumio was uh, mentioning called M+, which is part of the West Kowloon Cultural District, which is a large sort of future cultural development in Hong Kong. Um, this gives you some sort of idea of the location. This is a photo taken through uh, a work by Thomas Saraceno, which was part of an exhibition called Inflation last spring. And it sort of shows the sort of background of skyscrapers, which is the site for, for the museum. And we'll see a little bit more about that later on. Mm. To say something very briefly uh, about M+, uh, in our mission statement we say the following, that it's more than a museum or a building, it will be a new type of cultural institution focused on 20th and 21st century visual culture, broadly defined. Uh, from a Hong Kong perspective, with a perspective of now and with a global vision. Uh, and of course, as, as all these sort of mission statements, they are, have con tr you're trying to condense lots of ideas into one or two sentences, and they are what they are, but I think the essence is actually there. So I could stop there, but I won't do that. Um, I'll try to outline a little bit about what we're trying to do. And uh, I think it has to do with a number of things. Well, maybe I should say first that when I was recruited to this project, uh, there were basically three flags that were being waved that attracted me. The first one was that it clearly was from the government of Hong Kong, which is the, the organization that stands behind it, that took the, the initiative and that actually funds it. Um, it, it was that it's, it's a very ambitious project. And then I'm not just talking about size, it is a very ambitious project in terms of its budget and size and so forth, but there are always larger projects and bigger museums being built somewhere. So that's not the thing. I think also the ambition in terms of museological perspective was really something that attracted me a lot. And um, that paired with um, I should say a very strong public service ethos and the fact that it was underlined from day one that this is not a project that is primarily um, sort of created in order to attract tourists. It's primarily created as a project for the people who live and work in Hong Kong and it's, the aim is to really root it in, to root it in Hong Kong as well. Of course, naturally, we all know this who have been working with museums over the years, that it's exactly those museums that also become the big attractions for the rest of the world. Because, of course, the reason you travel is because you want to see something that is different from where you live and work. You want to see something else. So uh, a museum rooted in Hong Kong probably will also lead to it being a tourist attraction. But that's not the driver. I think that's important. So the, these two things, there was the ambition, and there was the sort of public service ethos, and the third thing, the third flag that was waved was the fact that we were actually asked, even though this was such a huge project, to try to rethink the models of what a museum could be in the 21st century and in Asia. To, we were sort of encouraged to challenge the givens. Uh, We'll see how much we do challenge the givens. I think that one, one of the key things we're trying to do is in a way also to maintain the idea of a museum and what the museum stands for, which are certain values, um, a sort of free space for ideas and uh, uh, a democratic space. And we try to maintain the symbolic value and the sort of recognition of that while at the same time uh, trying to rethink the existing models a bit. 
Just to say something about being a museum of visual culture and how that is different from being a museum of visual art or a museum of architecture or a museum of design because we're actually collecting visual art, architecture, design and what is called broadly called moving image which of course is not only cinema but it is cinema and of course Hong Kong has a strong history in terms of cinema and movies uh, but it's also all other aspects of moving image that uh, sort of happens under various categories and under different umbrellas in a sense. But being a museum of visual culture, I think to us is uh, about actually understanding that you have all these different categories and things are sometimes made under these headings, but that these headings are both if you look at it globally, more and more fluid, I think. I think if you look at it globally, I think there are lots of things that happen. Some of the most interesting things that happen, happen actually in the border areas between one type of category and another type of category quite often. And if you move to Asia, I think you uh, notice quite soon that, that actually these categories are not as valid here as they are typically in Europe or in America. There is much more fluidity between the categories among practitioners especially. Not so much among museums or, or in the market, but definitely among practitioners. And if you um, just look at a small place in Asia like Hong Kong, it's so obvious that some of the best artists are actually also the best graphic designers or maybe architects or maybe even advertising people and they can easily move from one, two, three of these roles within the same day without losing credibility in any of these areas. And I think that makes them, if you're not Andy Warhol, that makes it totally different from, for, and, and is a totally different from the situation in Europe, for example, where it's very hard to be trusted as an artist if you have uh, at the same time work in an advertising agency or if you work with graphic design or something like that. That is very hard to achieve, but it's more natural in Hong Kong, you would say. And what we're trying to do is, of course, not just doing what the Museum of Modern Art has done for many, many decades, which to, is to have departments for these different areas, but actually to try to create a museum that embraces this fluidity, this flow between these categories and, and look at them in parallel, while of course also recognizing that there are stories that are specific to um, each of these defined categories. You can't escape that at the same time, but, but to maintain that fluidity in the sense of dialogue. And this is of course reflected in how we plan the museum building, how we plan the team and how we collect. And this is, in a way, how we collect at the present. We collect visual culture. We have been, uh, we've gotten the furthest in, in the field of visual art, but in architecture and design, we have moved quite a bit as well. So if that's one thing we're doing, then the question is, what does it mean to have a global vision? Well, I think there are, I mean, among speakers today, for example, the Reina Sofia, and there will be later, say, uh, Tate in, in, uh, in the afternoon. Of course, there are museums with global visions as well. They look, but basically what they do, and what you do always, and what the great museums in the West have been doing is they've always looked at the world from where they are. When you walk around in Tate Modern, for example, you actually, you never doubt that you're in London when you see the works. You never doubt that you're in the UK uh, or in Europe, but you're also in the world. And I think um, in, uh, say, four or five years' time, when you hopefully walk around in, T in M+, you would see that you're maybe even in West Kowloon. This is the actual site of the future museum. There's a pointer here even. I can tell you exactly where it's going to be built. It is here, basically in this area. And this is a site that is uh, facing Hong Kong Island. So it's on the Victoria Harbor facing the central part of Hong Kong I Island and the sort of jungle of skyscrapers you have there. So you may know that you're in West Kowloon. You'll definitely notice that you're in Hong Kong and that 
together with the Pearl River Delta and China will form the core of the collection. There's no doubt about that. And that's not only when it comes to art, but to design, to architecture, and so forth. But we will also, of course, have uh, be uh, hopefully quite rich in our collection and in, and in our exhibition program when it comes to Asia and further afield. So in a way, we do what other museums have been doing in the West, but just shifting the perspective to simplify it a bit. Um, but then, of course, you also have the exhibition program. And the exhibition program can counter these things uh, I think that what Hong Kong artists have been longing for, and artists in the region have been longing for, is a platform where they can make exhibitions that are recognized outside the local art scene in Hong Kong. Just like in so many other cities, I mean here, uh, a Tokyo-based or, or a Japanese artist can have a show in the Mori Art Museum and the world will take note of that and will look at, closer at that artist and, and ponder, hmm, that's interesting, even if the, you don't know the name and don't know the, the body of work. And I hope that M Plus can become that platform for the artists from Hong Kong and from the region. But even more, maybe uh, it's almost an emergency, is uh, the need to bring art from the rest of the world to Hong Kong and to the audience who lives and works in Hong Kong and to the art scene there. That's something that's been lacking, absolutely, almost totally lacking over the years. Uh, and that, that's a long story why this is the case, but, but if you compare with performing arts, if you're interested in classic music or in ballet or something like that, you can almost go to a great concert every day with a major performer, conductor or so uh, in Hong Kong. But in terms of arts exhibi art exhibitions that, and design exhibitions and so forth, that's been a totally different story. That is, uh, of course, goes back in time, why that's the case. So to bring art from the rest of the world. And of course, also the exhibition program can also counter the sort of preliminary timeline we're working with. Um, typically, we expect that the collection will start, the stories will start around 1949, after the sort of major changes, the ha changes that happen in the region as a result of the creation of, of the People's Republic of China, uh, the movement of people, the sort of cultural and economical shifts that happened. Uh, but it's also a story that will go back occasionally further back in time. For example, might be of interest to a Tokyo audience. We recently bought um, a number of drawings of Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, designs for the Imperial Hotel here in Hong Kong, or in, in sorry, in Tokyo, uh, which was a building that was incredibly important for sort of the development of early modernism in Asia. And so it's a sort of a key building. And we want to sort of have some strings going down further in history uh, to sort of anchor the stories we're telling. And another aspect of the collection, I should say, is that we are, I think, slowly developing or is seen by practitioners, artists, designers around the world, a little bit uh, for Chinese artists in the diaspora or Chinese designers, Chinese architects, as a home away from home. And we've started to collect quite systematically now works by Chinese artists or artists with Chinese background, first, second, third generation, who have maybe a double cultural identity or so, and they are uh, uh, looking for uh, a place where they can find another type of resonance for their work, where the sort of their culture, the, the Chinese side of their cultural background and history can have another type of resonance. So that's an as aspect of the acquisition policy and possibly also the, of the exhibition program. We have a bit of a mantra, we have a number of mantras in the museum. One is more sort of focusing on the importance of education uh, and, and which is basically based on the, on the idea that the more you know, the more you see. It's a little bit going back to 
I think what David was talking about, also about connoisseurship ultimately, but about, you know, of course it's true. The more you know about anything in the world, the more you actually see and understand and discover also. And the second one is that we, you should never uh, confuse the museum with the building. And I think that's incredibly important. I think we all have a tendency, and I know reporters always have that tendency to sort of ask you, uh, so when will the museum open? And that is always, when is the building up there? But of course, the museum is really rather a content and its relationship to its audiences. It's a platform for this meeting, and the building is a tool as a part of that. But it is a rather uh, important tool, and it has um, symbolic value as well, which is rather important. So we are building a building. Let's see if it... And uh, these are some images of the relatively recently decided uh, design. It's uh, designed by Herzog and Dumeron, uh, the Swiss architecture team who, as it happened, also designed uh, uh, Tate Modern, but also here in Asia, for example, the Bird's Nest uh, Stadium in, in Beijing. And it's a rather simple and straightforward design, actually. It's basically like uh, two slabs, one horizontal slab, one vertical slab. And it's quite a confident building that also, of course, has to manage the sort of the skyscrapers behind the building and stand up against them without being able to sort of rise as high as they do. And we wouldn't want that. And it sits there on the waterfront. Um, in Hong Kong, uh, people have noticed that it looks exactly like Typhoon 3 warning. I don't know if you have the same warning system in, here in, in, in Tokyo, but that's like, it's not when the moment when everyone has to go home and close their doors and lock themselves in. It's a sort of, it's a pre-warning that something is building up. There is something being stirred up. Watch, be aware. And we sort of like that uh, symbolic side to it, actually. It's not so bad. It sits in the park, so it will have entrances from the more urban side of, of Hong Kong and the cultural district, and it will have entrances from the park, which will be quite leisurely and open and, 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 and welcoming and friendly. It has, I think, some features that are unique. Uh, it's built on, as uh, Fumio said, it's built on reclaimed land. Uh, and one would think that reclaimed land is a very neutral piece of land, but uh, it's, this is actually a piece of land that is full of tunnels and railway systems and God knows what. So it's like a minefield we're building in. And one of the things that sit under the building on one corner is this structure, which is actually the express train to, to the airport. And typically for I think Herzog and de Meron's uh, approach, instead of seeing it as many of the other competitors did, seeing it as a huge problem that you had to sort of get away from one way or another, try to cover up, try to build bridges over and or so, they instead did basically what they did at Tate Modern. They saw, whatever, when everyone else saw the turbine hall in Tate Modern as a big problem that you had to sort of navigate away from, they embraced it. And in a way, they've done the same here. They've created a found space, and they excavated the space, rather, and gave us a sort of an maybe awkward, but also amazing additional exhibition space, which is, of course, shaped by and sort of reflects the, uh, the tunnel structure, in a way, and makes you aware of the fact that that tunnel is there. Of course, at the same time, you have to isolate it from vibrations and things like that. So that just gives you some sort of idea of the thinking in, uh, about the building. Otherwise, it's, uh, this is far from the final design. This was their exhibition entry, and it's going through now uh, great revisions in terms of design. But it's, it's a building that, of course, will house and have all the functions you typically expect in a museum with the uh, white cubes and black boxes, but also um, what we, and it's really quote unquote industrial space because you can't really 
you can't simulate industrial space in a new built ex museum building, but uh, sp spaces that have are more like almost uh, like uh, black box theater or a theater space or so with gantry cranes in the ceilings, high ceilings, raw materials where you can do things that you typically can't do in, in these museums. And it's a large one. It's about 60,000 square meters, and that gives us about 15,000 square meters of exhibition space. And uh, then, of course, libraries, archives, auditoriums, cinemas, uh, different types of screening rooms, and so forth. I think one of the important things that we're trying to do is to rethink also the modes of presentation, the kind of physical spaces, but also the intellectual spaces that you need for for a museum that is where it is. I mean, for example, is there a different type of space for the presentation of, of works that are ink art works that maybe uh, actually live their lives on scrolls? The traditional way of looking at scrolls, of course, is a much more intimate process uh, where you, uh, and much more collective in a way, you often roll things up together, study it, and, and so you don't look, look at them as paintings on the walls behind glass, for example. Is there another space and another system of looking and are there other, even other digital uh, means that you can help amplify this experience and, and get closer to the original sort of scholarly experience, for example? Are there alternative spaces for viewing and looking at moving image material where you can be more active as a, as a viewer than in the existing sort of projection uh, one-to-one -one type of situation? Uh, are there places where you actually can curate yourself, be active, pair, compare, as you do when you walk around in the painting exhibition, for example? Uh, and are there third spaces that we can explore? Can you break up this barrier between front of house and back of house? Um, can you, I mean, the, the idea of third space, I think, was was developed, uh, or the, the model that was used when sociologists talked about third space was actually the cafe in the TV series Friends. You know, the place that was neither at home or at work, but another space. And in, in a way, can you sort of break up that barrier between the secret things in the museum and the obvious ones? And already museums are working on that, but we try to explore it f further. Uh, on the upper left is actually an example from uh, my previous museum at the Moderna Museet, which is like a jukebox for art, actually. It's a sort of robot that brings art to you uh, that you've chosen to look at. And uh, this is an example of, of making uh, conservation processes and so uh, more visible. And of course, as I said, the museum, it's, uh, you shouldn't confuse the museum with the building. And in parallel to building this building, we're actually we're building a digital building, so to say, a digital space, which is equally important almost now, not only in terms of reaching audiences, communicating with audiences, but also because it is a, a platform for production and dissemination of works that are made specifically for digital art or for a digital platform, which is pretty obvious. And again, we're not only in the building, we will be outside the building. So public art will be uh, a central element uh, for us, as well as trying to maintain an exhibition program that just does just not happen within the building, but continues to happen out in the city as we are doing now. We have a quite extensive uh, program called Mobile M Plus that takes place in different parts of Hong Kong, in different types of locations. Uh, a few times per year. So that's an important reminder as well to re always think about the building as a tool and as a focal point and as a symbol, but it's not the same as the museum. The museum goes beyond all of that. Thank you.